It's not a Father's Day message. Um, in fact, it's a message that I give with a little bit of fear and trembling <laughs> because I'm going to uh, suggest something that um, you've probably never heard before. It's one of those things that uh, I encountered in my doctoral studies many years ago under an esteemed professor who was born and raised in Long Beach, California, uh, attended UCLA as well as Dallas Seminary, and as I studied under him, I became aware of a, a premise that almost governs all discussion about this issue. And I said, I, I don't think the text supports what your premise is, so I'm going to address that issue this morning, but I'll preface it by reading from Scripture a couple of places. Um, my brother Bob is an Old Testament professor. He's an expert in Hebrew. Um, his specialty is the Old Testament. And um, he keeps me connected to Jewish exegetes, Jewish scholars. They're not believers necessarily. Uh, one of them, his name is Benjamin uh, Summers. He is a professor of Hebrew. Jewish Theological Seminary in New York City, New York. And he's not a believer uh, that I know of, although he may have some thoughts about it. But he um, has written and has been passed on to me from my brother some thoughts that uh, I'll share with you, and it comes out in his translation of Genesis 126. And he prefaces Genesis 126, which normally we understand as um, <clears throat> let us make humanity in our image according to our likeness. He'll translate that just a tad different based on his understanding of the Hebrew. I'll get to that in a minute. But here's what he has to say. The God of the Hebrew Bible has a body. This must be stated at the outset because so many people, including many scholars, assume otherwise. The evidence for this simple thesis is overwhelming, so much so that asserting the nature of the biblical God should not occasion surprise. Here's his translation. Let us make humanity in our form. We normally read the word image. Let us make humanity in our form according to our shape so that they rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and the beasts and over all the earth and all the creeping things that creep on the earth. He says this verse assumes that one aspect of the eternal God has a shape and a body after whom our bodies and our shape is made. That's where I'm going this morning. Now I'll read from Col Colossians 115, which we've dealt with before in the past. Speaking of Christ, Paul says, He is the image of the God who is invisible. He is the firstborn of all creation because, verse 16, by him, Christ, the image of God, all things in heaven and upon the earth have been created, whether things visible or visible, thrones, lordships, rulers, and authorities, all things through him, Christ, and for him were created. Image. Paul says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. What does the word image mean? 100% of the time in the Bible, the Old and New Testament, no exceptions. Image always refers to something that you can see every single time. I'll show you proof of that as we go through the Bible. And so that through all eternity, Christ shape and the form of a body. 
pre-incarnate, and then in his incarnate days, he took on a human form. But prior to that, he had a divine form. And our bodies are prototypes of that. Not in terms of the substance. Ours is made of clay. His is eternal. That's where I'm headed this morning. And uh, so, having said that, let me ask you to join me in a moment of moment prayer. It is a sacred and special privilege to stand in any kind of a place like this and talk about God from the scriptures. It's it really no one deserves to do it, much less me. So we all admit that the reason we're here this morning is due, as the words in the psalm say, due to sovereign grace. We're alive today because of grace. We're saved today because of grace. We have a body to live in that's healthy, that can stand up, that can speak and hear and see and smell because of grace. We don't deserve it, but you grace us by making us in our mother's womb, perhaps giving us parents, receiving their guidance. And once somebody along the line introduced us to you, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we want to learn about you and your Son and the Spirit today. And we trust that the work of the Spirit of God will be everywhere around the world, in every place where the gospel is preached, whether it's a beach somewhere, in a jungle, in a cathedral, in a storefront, <clears throat> by a river, or in a school, wherever it is, a jail, a prison, honor your word, give life to the words of the speaker, male or female, and may your kingdom, your rule, Advance and beat down barriers, push away darkness, give hope where there's despair, bring forgiveness where there's guilt and discouragement. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on planet as it always is done. In heaven, I ask for your glory in Christ's name. We have something on our head that allows us. To enjoy the smell of bacon. I don't smell bacon because I have a set of eyes or because I have a set of ears. Uh, when you smell meat cooking on the grill, pork chops, steak, bacon, you enjoy the aroma. During wintertime, we have a fireplace and I find cedar wood if I can. So I cut it up, I split it, and I put it in the fireplace, and I go outside. And have you ever smelled cedar smoke outside of the house? Oh, the aroma is wonderful. So whether I'm smelling the smoke from cedar logs burning, or bacon, or pork chops, or even taco meat, <laughs> the reason I'm able to do that is because I have a smell. I have a nose. Most of you, as I look out here, are graced with the same thing. Some are larger, some are smaller. The Lord said to Moses in Leviticus chapter 1, verse 9 and 13, speaking of the burnt offering that they place on the altar, and it's an animal. It's an animal, so it's meat, so it's cooking. It is a burnt offering, an offering made by fire, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Now, if God could smell the pleasing of aroma of burning meat sacrifices offered up in the courtyard of the tabernacle in the temple later on, doesn't that suggest that he's got a nose? How could an invisible God Smell something without a nose. The Lord said to Moses in chapter 33 of Exodus, You cannot see my face and live. Notice, he doesn't say you can't see my face. God has a face. You can't see it and live. 
One was saying, if you see my face, you're not going to live. You're going to die. Now, if during a storm, and this has happened to us, one of your wires, your high voltage wires, that belongs to Duke Energy, if it fell to the ground, and it did in our yard one time, during a heavy storm, if it fell to the ground, and the guy from Duke Energy came, and he said, if you touch that high voltage wire, you will not live. He's not telling us that there's no such thing as a high voltage wire. He's telling us what? That if you touch it, you won't live. The same thing is what God is saying to Moses. You cannot see my face and live. A little later in the same chapter, which seems to be somewhat contradictory, Moses said to the Lord, show me your glory. Show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will make all my goodness pass before your face, and I will proclaim the Lord by name before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy to whom I show mercy. But then he added, but you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. God has a face. You just can't see it. That is, you can see it, but you won't live. Then the Lord said, here is a place by me. You will station yourself on a rock. When my glory passes by, remember Moses said, show me your glory. When my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you, Moses, with my hand. It must have been a big hand to cover Moses. Then I will take away my hand, and you will see my back. But my face, you must not see. So God has a back, and he's got a face. How could he have a back and a face but be invisible? These and other questions about God's body pestered me ever since I sat under my first doctoral supervisor, John Selhammer. He's now in heaven. He uh, contacted some rare disease in midlife and died. Um, and I, I normally would share this information, but <clears throat> when I studied under him, I was focusing on one word in the Hebrew Bible in Genesis 3, chapter 5, verse 22 and 24, Genesis 6, verse 8, Genesis 17, verse 2. It's the word halak in Hebrew, or to walk, or to take a stroll. But I studied it in uh, what's called the hip pile stem. Don't lose, don't lose me here. And the idea of the word walk in the hip pile stem means to walk back and forth, to make it a habit, to walk. So you're walking back and forth. That was the word I studied. It's used with Noah, who walked with God, with Enoch, who walked with God, and the Lord God in chapter 3, verse 8 of Genesis, where it says, and the Lord God used to walk back and forth in the garden in the breezy time of the day. And then in chapter 17, God comes to Abram and says, walk before me, and he blameless. So I would say to Dr. Selma, my supervisor, it sounds like the Lord had a body. I mean, how can you not have a body and walk? He didn't say the Lord used to fly around the garden like an angel or like a ghost or swoop around and glide around because he had wings. It says he used to walk in the garden, in the breezy part of the day. He would walk back and forth. And I would assume that he would walk with Adam and Eve in the garden, in paradise. Um, to take this further, as you know, when Eve took the fruit, handed it to Adam, Adam took it and ate, they realized they were naked. What did they do? They fled and hid in the trees. And the Lord came and he said to Adam, where are you? He was looking for him and he couldn't see him. He was hiding in the trees. So how could you have a person who's looking but had no eyes, who speaks but has no mouth? And who walks, who has no feet. So I'd say to him, I don't get that. It sounds like the Lord had a body. I mean, it talked, 
It walked. It heard sounds. And Adam said, um, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid. He wasn't afraid of seeing God. He was afraid because what? He was naked. He was embarrassed because he was naked. So he would look at me, and he says, well, there's just an assumption in studies that, that no part of God had a body. There's just that assumption. I said, but what about these texts? And I'm going to take you through a bunch of them in the Testament. Like, for example, when Jacob wrestled with a man all through the night. How do you wrestle with somebody who doesn't have a body? So, he said, well, there's just an assumption. Even regardless of all these texts that you have, the assumption is, and this assumption governs all the discussions, whether you believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or simply a Jewish God, no body. And so that when Jesus became a human, born of the Virgin Mary, he was taking on a body for the very first time. And that kind of has governed all the discussions. I'd like to argue differently this morning. Um, let's look at the word image, for, for example. I, I said I would talk about image. The word image in the Old Testament, 100% of the time, means something that you can see in visible. For example, Nebuchadnezzar, in the book of Daniel, built what? A huge image, right? It was something that you could see, and he commanded everybody in the kingdom to fall down and worship. Remember that? So an image is something you can see. If we are created according to the image or the shape or the fashion of God, that says that God has an image, that God's image is visible. Later on in the same story of Nebuchadnezzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, thrown into the furnace, right? They hid the, the fire seven times, and when Nebuchadnezzar looked into the furnace, what did he say? You remember what he said? He said, I thought I threw three dudes into the furnace, but I see four men walking around, and one of them looks like what? The son of God. Um, one example of image in the New Testament. Same thing. When Jesus was questioned about paying taxes, uh, should it, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? What did he say? He said, show me a denarius. Now, this is not a denarius. He said, show me a denarius. And he said, and Jesus said, whose image is on the coin? Whose image is on the denarius? And they said, well, Caesar. On the image of every Roman coin was a visible image, the face, the head of Caesar. This is a quarter, and it has an image on it. What is it? You remember who's on the, the U.S. quarter? George Washington. It's his image. Here's a pen. It has an image. Who is it of? Lincoln. Here is a nickel. Here's five cents. It has an image of it. Whose is it? Anybody know? I'll let you guess on that. <laughs> Point is, 100% of the time in the Bible, Old or New Testament makes no difference. Image is something you can see. So when we are made in God's image, God has an image, what is it? Well, Paul, Paul says, in Colossians 1.15, he, Christ, is the image of the invisible God. He's the image, something you can see, of the invisible God. It doesn't say he became the image in time. He uses present tense. He is, he's always been the image of the invisible Father. If I can trade the word Father for God. You see where I'm going? See where I'm going? Um, 
to understand a little more clearly what Genesis 1.26 means. Let us make humanity in our shape, our fashion, our image, our likeness. Those same two words are used a little bit later in chapter 5, Genesis, of Adam and Seth, father and son. Seth is the thirdborn son to Adam. And the text says, when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own image, his own shape, in his own likeness, and he named him Seth. You see what Moses, the writer of Genesis, just did? He explains what the word image is that he used in chapter 1, verse 26, by saying that Adam, who was made in the image of Christ, image of God, that Adam had a son, and that son was created according to his image, his likeness. Same exact Hebrew words from Genesis 1. So we have Christ, who's an image, Adam is made after Christ, and Seth is made after Adam. What's the writer trying to tell us? Well, that God has a visible person, a visible image of himself, a son. And he reproduces people just like him. What is he trying to tell us? He's saying that people are different from animals. Animals reproduce after their kind. They're not made after the image of God. So, if Adam walks upright, on two feet, with fingernails, and has skin and hair on the top of his head, and a mouth, and two ears, and one nose, and two eyes, then Seth, who's made in his image, is going to be the same exact kind of human. He's telling us that Adam produced a son in his likeness, but he's not like a monkey who bends over a monkey and who has claws and fur. He's not like a fish that has scales and swims. He's not like a bird that has wings and flaps those wings. He's like his God. He's made in the shape and the form of God. Now, some of the shapes are really tall, six foot seven. Some of them are shorter. Some of them are a little bit wider. Some of them have red hair. Some of them have freckles. But they all have what? The basic same form and shape. Two legs, two feet, ten toes, no claws, no skin, or no, uh, <laughs> no scales. <laughs> Thank God for skin. So that we look like, in our form and our shape, we look like our Creator. We look like our Creator. What's different between us and the Son of God is what we're made of. We are made of what? We're subject to what? Weakness, sickness, and death. We have a body that's made of dirt. And to dirt or dust we shall return. But God's body is eternal. God had a shape and a contour, but it's eternal. It's not subject to death. It's not mortal. It's immortal. We don't know what his body is made of. I don't know. Nobody has really unveiled that in Scripture. Now, so what I want to do now is take you through um, some accounts in the Old Testament real quickly. In Genesis 18, the Lord, in a body, walks to Abraham's tent, and he engages Abraham in a conversation. He talks, he walks, he speaks, and he listens. That's Genesis 18. Genesis 32, Jacob took his wives, his female servants, he crossed the Jebok River, and he was left alone. And it says that a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Why daybreak? Because you're not supposed to see God and live. When the man saw that he could not defeat Jacob, he struck the socket of his hip so that the socket of his hip was dislocated while he wrestled with him. And then the man said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. I will not let you go, Jacob replied, unless you bless me. 
And the man asked, what's your name? And he answered, my name's Jacob. And the man said, no longer will your name be Jacob, but Israel, because you have fought with God and with men and have prevailed. And then Jacob said, tell me your name. And the man who wrestled with him said, why do you ask my name? And the man replied, then he blessed Jacob there. And so Jacob named the place Peniel, hear this, certainly I have seen God's face to face and I have survived. I saw God face to face, I saw God face to face and I survived. Joshua 5. Joshua saw a man standing in front of him with a sword drawn in his hand. And that man with the sword said, I am the commander of the Lord's armies. Remove your sandals from your feet because the place where you are standing is what? Holy ground. Who else heard those same words? Moses. By the burning bush, take off your sandals because you are standing on our Holy God. Who was Moses talking to? God in the fire, the burning fire, the burning bush. Judges and Gideon, the story of Gideon, Judges 6. At the end of a conversation where the Lord appeared to Gideon, Gideon realized who he was talking to, and he said, Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the message, the messenger of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said, Don't be afraid, you won't. Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. His clothing filled the palace. When John looks back at that event, John the Apostle, in chapter 12, verse 41, he said, Isaiah was talking about the glory of Jesus that he saw. That's John, under inspiration of the Spirit, interpreting Isaiah 6 that says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his clothing fell to the ground. Isaiah saw the body of Jesus before his incarnation. The prophet Amos, chapter 9, verse 1, quote, I saw God standing at the altar. Now, is there any evidence in the New Testament for this? I've shown you stories through the Old Testament of people at various times in history seeing a shape and a form of God. Well, Paul, in Philippians 2, 5, through 11, ushers into his story to the Philippians the greatest picture of the humiliation and humbleness of Jesus. Why? Because the Philippian church had conflict and fighting. It was one of the most divided churches in the New Testament. Conflict, argument, people thinking more highly of themselves than they should. And so what does he do? To cure the problem of fighting and conflict and bickering and arguing and thinking they're better than the other person. What's his cure? Here it is. He says, you should have the same mindset towards one another that Christ Jesus had, who, though he existed in the form of God, What's the form of God mean? God had what? A form. A shape. Even though he existed in the form of God, did not re regard equality with God as something to be held onto, but he emptied himself taking on the form of what? The form of a what? A slave. Form always means a substance that you can see and has those same attributes. So the form of God means he looked like God, but he had the attributes of God. Even though he existed in the form of God, 
He did not consider equality with God as something to be held onto, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave. So he goes from the highest to the lowest. Be humble with them. That's the cure for conflict. Be humble. A proud person always stirs up strife and argument and bickering. He or she is the source of all conflict and division and divorce. But a person who's humble will say, I'm going to give up my rights. I'm going to give up my entitlement. I'm going to give up. I'm going to even be mistreated, lied about, stabbed in the back like Jesus. And I will continue to serve God. That's Jesus. He's the cure for division. He's the cure for conflict. Um, one other verse is Romans 1. If I can find it here, I knew I wrote it down somewhere. <laughs> yes, Romans 1. The wrath of God, permit me to read this to get the full context. Romans 1. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and, un and the unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth by their unrighteousness. Because what can be known about God is plain to them. God has made it plain to them. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen because they are understood through what has been made. So people are without excuse. Why are people without excuse? Verse 21, because Although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give him thanks, and they became empty or futile in their thinking, and their senseless hearts were darkened. Here it is, verse 22, Romans 1, 22. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image, there's our word, image resembling corruptible human beings and animals and birds and reptiles. Idolatry in a culture occurs when we suppress the truth of God, we fail to give them thanks, and what do people do? They begin to exchange the glory, the glorious form of God, which is not able to be reproduced, and this is why God says, don't make graven images of me. Don't make graven images, things you can see. Don't! You cannot do that. It's impossible to create an image by human hands that accurately represents God. But people have taken that incorruptible form of God and they've exchanged it for what? Idols that, are made, that look like people liable to decay, liable to death, liable to sickness. In the Tower of Babel, the Lord came down from heaven to see and investigate and take a closer look at what people were building. It's funny because God had to come down to see the tower that went up to heaven. Hagar ran away from Sarah, who she believed was mistreating her. And she gave a name to God. You are the God who sees me. Here I have seen the one who sees me. All right. What am I suggesting this morning? I'm suggesting that the second person of what we call the Trinity, the Son of God, who became Jesus, or who was named Jesus in the New Testament, had a body from all eternity. But that body was different from yours in terms of its nature. Ours is made from dirt. His has always been. It's an eternal nature. And it's not subject to sickness, or death, or fevers, or whooping cough, or any kind of weakness. But we see Jesus thirsty at the well in John chapter 4, tired. We never see that of 
the eternal God in his form and shape as a body. That's what I'm trying to suggest this morning. So that when we take all these passages, we just don't automatically explain them away simply because we have this premise that says God is invisible, he's always been invisible, including the one part of God that we can see in the Old Testament all the way through. There's some questions before I get to my takeaway here that I don't have answers to. Again, this is something that's in development, something to think through, but here's some questions. Why are some people terrified of seeing God in the Old Testament and others don't seem to be troubled at all? Why was Moses told not to see God's face and yet Amos wasn't troubled at all? Isaiah saw the face of God and he was troubled and the Lord said, don't worry, you're not doomed, you'll live. And he took a burning coal from the altar and touched him and healed him. How is it that God is in the heavens and can dwell in the tabernacle? How is it that God is in the heavens but he is in the temple? With that pillar of fire indicating his presence. How could God in the New Testament be in the heavens and yet he comes down personally and confronts Saul of Tarsus in Acts 9, verse 4, and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And, and he said, who are you, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus. How could he be here but not at the right hand of the Father? These are questions that I don't have all the answers to. These are just a sample of some of the questions that I have. Now, let's move to takeaway. Just two brief takeaways. And maybe the first one's not brief. Maybe it's a little bit longer. As I understand the incarnation, when Jesus became flesh and blood, identifying with us, so that his body could actually die on the cross for our sins. His body in the eternal state could not die. So he couldn't die on the cross. So he had to take on human flesh to experience what we went through, yet was without sin. How does this impact our life? Um, let me give you an analogy. This is a story that I just made up. It's not a real story. But it's designed to help us to appreciate what I'm saying this morning. Let's say there's a big family. Let's say there's eight kids. And the oldest is a boy. And he was born able to walk like you. Two functional arms, a head, eyes that see, ears that hear, mouth that speaks and tastes and able to sit, able to run, fully functional body. But then child number two, three, four, five, and six were born, natural born children, but they all were crippled. They all were paraplegics and they all had to be confined to a wheelchair. They couldn't speak and they couldn't walk. So mom and dad now have four or five boys and girls growing up crippled for life. They both have a form. The oldest one has a form of a human. These also have a form of a human, but they're misshapen. They're crippled. They can't walk. Their mouth doesn't function. And their brains are slow. Let's say that the oldest son made a deal with God said, Father, when I look at my brothers and sisters bound to a wheelchair, they can't go outside and play. They can't go and swim in the river. They can't play baseball. They can't play with their dollhouse. They can't be runners on the field. They can't do polo bowl. They can't play a game of football. They can't even enjoy a hot dog dinner with baked beans. I love my brothers and sisters, and I'm willing to trade bodies with them. If you will give them a fully functional body, a girl has a girl's body, a 
and my brothers have a holy body, I'm willing to be bound in a wheelchair for the rest of my life and die early if you will let them stand up out of that chair and run free. And God says, yes, okay. And so with the agreement and the exchange, the little boys and girls stand up out of their chair and start running and playing tag. And the oldest son becomes a criminal, confined to a wheelchair, and dies early in life. That, I think, is what happened. Jesus has, of course, he wasn't Jesus prior to Bethlehem. He was the Son of God without name. He had a heavenly, eternal body shaped like ours, but no limitations. He could appear and disappear. He could show up over here and then go over there. Immense power. This is what it took for him to be the creator. The New Testament witnesses that Jesus, before he became Jesus in name, was the creator. He spoke, things happened. That's powerful. He spoke and worlds came into being. And he gave all that up. He gave up that body, that eternal body, to become human flesh, subject to death and weakness and tiredness. And finally, crucified on the cross for our sins. This, I think, helps us as humans to understand the nature of humility. The nature of humility is letting go of everything I think that is mine to keep. I get to have the last word in an argument. I get to have my agenda in my family. I get to spend money the way I want to spend it. I get to have my opinion prevail. Even when I'm insulted, I'm going to get back. No. Humility is like, even if I've been cheated, even if I've been wrong, even if I've been kicked below the belt, even if I've been lied about and stabbed in the back and wounded and hurt and I didn't get the pay raise I should have got, did not get the promotion I should have got, I'm going to remain humble and let the Lord do his work. That's humility, and it's the key to this unity. If everyone in a family will do that, you will have peace and you will have harmony. And the one to show us the way is Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate uh, example of humility. Last, second takeaway, last takeaway. Every person you meet, a boy or girl, skin is either black, brown, some shade in between, dirty, homeless, ugly, that person is the image of God and has value and worth. Maybe a homeless boy on the street. A woman from some tribe in the middle of the jungle, half naked, somebody drastically overweight, somebody who's very simple minded, a paraplegic, someone who's handicapped in many ways, right there is the image of Christ. Value and worth. God don't make no junk. Everyone is valuable, everyone is deserved treated like we are treating Christ. And that's why racism is so awful. It is saying, I'm valuable and you are not because you're not like me. Presence, looking down on people, being unforgiving, being arrogant, being mean and cruel. Everyone has value. Everyone. It came from God. Think of what would happen in our world today if everyone was humble <laughs> and we treated everyone with what? Dignity and worth and kindness and value. What kind of a world would we live in? Would it be a little different from today? You see men struggling? Drug addiction? Sickness? 
He's got dignity. He's got daddy. Let's show it to him. Yes, there are consequences. I understand. Thank you for listening. Let's stand.